Um, hi guys, uh, my name is Lars Arbeldsson. Nowadays I work at Chipstead Media Group. Uh, I used to work in the past here at Six. Uh, and uh, during my industrial life I worked at uh, Google, a data startup, finance tech, and doing data infrastructure at Spotify. Um, so I've do done a lot of counting. Counting things, bits, songs, money. And this presentation is all about counting. Uh, I saw somewhere in an internal blog at some point that, yeah, we were supposed to do thing, show stuff, uh, count stuff in real time, uh, but since that cannot be done, we instead use historical values and extrapolate it with some cool math. Um, and that surprised me a bit because counting stuff in real time is actually not that hard. Uh, but there is a myth, I think it comes from the popularity of Hadoop, that it, if you count lots of things or handle big data, it has to take hours. It has to be slow. Uh, so I'm here to sort of debunk that myth a bit and show you that it's actually fairly simple to do uh, count lots of things in real time. And uh, that you can do it basically with the knowledge that you already have today. Uh, there's no magic involved. Um, so uh, you can do it. You can actually do uh, very accurate counting. Uh, it's not that difficult as long as you uh, do some bucketing, uh, aggregate things in a scalable manner. I if you f if you find a way to s to uh, to bucket your stuff, uh, and that way can handle a lot of data, then you're fine. Because th when you handle the aggregated data, it's not uh, it's a small amount of data, and you can just display it. For most people, this is overkill. This is heavier than what you need, and there are a bunch of tricks uh, where you can get away with a lot less machinery and complexity if you just sacrifice your accuracy. And that's the topic for today. Um, it turns out that in many cases, for the scenarios where you want uh, real-time data, the accuracy is not important. For the If you want accurate stuff, you can usually wait a while and churn things, uh, dump things, your Hadoop cluster, so forth. But if you have a scenario like this, you have a user and he searches on Blocket, he finds a, a nice expensive violin, and then a couple of minutes later he, he is browsing for some dinner tonight, then if you react quickly you might be able to give him the recommendation that he actually go and see this violin concert, if, if that happens to be in your, uh, as part of your company. Um, now, in order to do so, your recommendations need to react quickly, right? Uh, you need to react within seconds after his browsing for dinners in order to serve this kind of recommendation right away. So recommendation systems is, is a bit of magic, uh, but uh, if you just solve these three basic building blocks, uh, counting how many distinct items have passed in, in the last time window, uh, what items were most popular, and can you please give me the count for this particular item? If you, if you just solve these three bu uh, basic building blocks, you can build complex things like accommodation systems on top of this. So I'll go through one of the, each of these and show how it fairly easily can be done, uh, even with large amounts of data. So first one, uh, the cardinality. Um, that's actually fairly straightforward. If you do it naively, you can just hash whatever's coming in, keep an ordered list of hashes, and, uh, and then count the list that you have. It's sort of like a hash set, but, without w but if you happen to have duplicates, you just ignore that and miscount a bit. And you can choose the number of bits you want per item, uh, 32 or 64 if you want to be really accurate, or smaller if you want to. Uh, uh, be more compact. Now, approximate set applications that might remind you of, of something called bloom filters. Uh, a bloom filter uh, works in this way. For each thing coming in, you, you compute a number of hash functions, and then you have a bit vector, and you set the, depending on those hash functions, you set the uh, appropriate items to number one. And then if you look things up in the bloom filter, you check for this particular item, the hash functions are all one, yes, then we have a hit. Sometimes you get a false positive, but usually you're fine. Uh, but you can't count the number of items that you put in the bloom filters, so therefore you keep a counter on the side, and for each 
uh, for each item coming by, you see, is this in the bloom filter? No, I up my counter. Fine, very straightforward, much more compact than the set of hashes. Now, um, if you actually look to implement these things, uh, you don't only want to, typically don't only want to count the, um, the number of things that have passed since Big Bang, you want to count the number of things that have passed since like a few minutes ago or an hour ago or something. So you, you in implementation, you want to time bucket things and uh, keep it history and compare with earlier and so forth. Um, and for all the data, the granularity is not so important, so you probably want to like aggregate your time buckets so instead of minutes, have five minutes or hours or so, something. Now, in order to do so, it's, it's useful if these representations are so-called monoids, uh, that stuff that you can add uh, and aggregate, basically. That's also useful if you want to use a cluster uh, implementation to do the counting. Uh, unfortunately, your bloom filter and counter is not a monoid. So we proceed a bit. Um, Next attempt, uh, you do the set of hashes again. Uh, and, but instead of storing the hashes, you have a bitmap. So if you decide that your hash is 16 bits, you have a, a 65k bits uh, bitmap, i.e. Uh, 8 kilobytes, and then you count the bits instead. Fine, this is a monoid representation. Uh, so you're doing fine. Then you still are uh, miscounting a bit. It turns out that you can actually uh, estimate how much you are miscounting and tweak your numbers coming out based on that estimate in order to get a better count. And by now, you're not really naive anymore. Uh, you've done so much thinking that you can produce an academic paper about it and call it the linear probabilistic counter. Um, and once you realize that somebody might have done this before, you go about and read some papers, and you find the hyper log log counter, which I'm not going to try to explain to you. And uh, here you can see a comparison of, of the number of bits that you need to uh, represent. The input here is Shakespeare's completed work, and the, the accurate count with the Java hash set implementation uh, you see at the top, and the uh, the linear probabilistic counter and the hyperlog log counter below. As you can see, you need very few bytes if you can tolerate a few percent uh, miscounting. The hyperlog log guys came, claim that they can count cardinality of a billion things with 2% errors in a few kilobytes of storage. And why do you need it to be so small? Because you remember the time window slide earlier? Since there are lots of time windows that you want to count, the, the smaller you make your representations, the, the better granularity you can have in, in time windows and the longer history you can store in memory. Cool, that was cardinality. Uh, now, how about uh, counting the top list of things? We used to do that at Spotify. We counted the most common artists or the most popular artists, most popular songs and so forth. For artists, it doesn't make sense to be fancy because they can fit easily in memory, but for songs, uh, it's not so easy. Um, so that this one is actually really trivial. Uh, you just keep, keep a top list of, of K items. Um, and you assume that if you get something that is not in the top list, it has the same count as the lower th lowest thing in your top list. So if you, some weird Swedish artist comes along that's actually not very popular, uh, you assume that he is as popular as, as the bottom item, Dolly Parton in this case, uh, and you massively overestimate his popularity. But he will be kicked out fairly soon, so it doesn't matter. Um, and if you just keep the top K large enough, you will have accurate counts at the top, and uh, not so accurate count at the bottom, but just expand it enough. Um, now, this becomes slightly more complex uh, with the relation to the time windows, because every time you open a new time window, a new second or, or minute bucket or something, you start out fresh, so you will get more error. So you may want to tweak this, this ranking a bit and take like history, previous time windows in account. And I will leave that as the, the dreaded exercise for the reader. OK, so now it's only the last piece, how to uh, um, look up uh, the popularity of a particular item. And 
Then you can use something called account min sketch, which is a data structure uh, inspired by the Bloom filter. And instead of having a single bit vector, you have a, a matrix of multiple counters. And for each item that you want to increment by, by one, or actually by an arbitrary number, you compute uh, uh, the same number of hashes as rows in your matrix. And then you let the hashes determine which of the columns that you increase by one. And when you later want to look up something, you look up in the same uh, columns uh, determined by your hashes, then you take the minimum number. So in this, for this item that we insert in the green case, uh, when we look, up, look it up later, the minimum is, will be 2 plus 1, 3. Um, there is a slight risk of uh, overcounting things, but you no will never undercount. And you can estimate the error uh, given your, your data distribution and the size of your matrix and the number of stuff that you put in there. And in order to, we did a, uh, a hack implementation of this at Spotify in order to count accurately, accurately count the popularity of songs. Globally, you need on the order of a, like a half a megabyte of matrix or something. So it's not a big thing to put in memory. We could do it with time windows counting back. OK, you can actually use this to uh, <coughs> have a better implementation of the top K problem. Instead of assuming that your, stuff at the <coughs> your absent stuff has the same value as the bottom, you can look it up in the, in the count min sketch. And you keep a, uh, in this case, it's not called the top K anymore. It's called a heavy hitters list. Uh, I think this terminology might come from Twitter. Uh, they use this technology to count the most popular tweets. And you can add dimensions here as well. Th this is very simple if you want to count the globally most popular song. Uh, if you want to, uh, to also throw in some more dimensions to figure out the most popular song in Sweden or among Swedish teenagers and s or something, then you make a, instead of just using one thing, the, the song ID for a key, you combine it with a couple of other dimensions and uh, use use a tuple for hashing. So the first one here will be uh, globally for, for U2, and you throw in also throw in the value of Sweden U2, age U2, and Sweden age group U2. And when you want to look up, do lookups later, uh, uh, you, can, you can look up by recreating these tuples. And now this simplify, or this complicates the, the heavy hitters implementation a bit, because you need to potentially keep a heavy hitters list of all of these combinations. So it doesn't scale to very many dimensions, but for a few, you're fine. And you can also compact the heavy hitters list because there will be lots of duplication uh, between the, uh, the most popular items in, in Sweden and in Norway and globally and so forth. Uh, I haven't seen an implementation that takes this into account, but so I'll leave that as well for, as an exercise for the reader. Uh, you can compact the, the uh, amount of memory that you need quite a lot. Okay, so in, in reality, if you actually set out to do something like this, wha what kind of machinery do you need? It turns out for the commercial implementations out there that do these things, they can process on the order of, of 10,000 messages per second uh, for, for roughly for these, uh, these kind of data structures. That also happens to be the same order of magnitude as the number of messages uh, coming into Spotify. So unless you have more than 50 million users or unless they produce a lot of more data, you probably only need one machine. If you don't, if for some, some reason you need to uh, process more data, uh, this maps really well to, to streaming uh, framework implementations such as Storm. Um, and uh, when you integrate this into your, uh, into your sort of data flow, my advice would be to keep it sort of asynchronous and keep, it, keep the counting machinery, re both reading and publishing from a uh, pub sub channel, that, because that takes it off your, uh, off your fast path. You, uh, you don't want important down downstream stuff to depend on these things. If you use Kafka, 
as your uh, pub and sub channel. Kafka has the property that it keeps a long history back in time, so even if your counting goes down, you can just start the machine up again and it will catch up with, uh, with the previous messages. There is an interesting alternative that was also actually experimentally implemented at Spotify, and that is to take every single message that comes in and dump it into an Elasticsearch cluster. How many people are familiar with Elasticsearch or have heard of it? A few people. Uh, so Elasticsearch will uh, take whatever you throw at it. It's supposed to be structured with uh, uh, schema-less data and index over all of the dimensions that happen to be in your, in your data. And it's really good at counting things. Um, and then you can just query it along these cube, like uh, geo, age, uh, genre, or whatever dimensions that you want to add. So if you have more dimensions than ju just, uh, the, for example, the geo and the age, and want to do analytics on, on, on all of the dimensions, th this might be a, a viable approach as well. You need a bit more machinery because the Elasticsearch requires a bunch of machines, but it's it's also very scalable, so you're fine. And it's it's a fairly simple approach. Okay, uh, I promised that you could do uh, things such as recommendations with these techniques. Um, the I won't try to teach you recommendations. I'm not qualified for that. The one popular variant uh, or, or algorithm for this is called uh, collaborative filtering. Uh, if you use that technique, you build up matrices of, of like typically user and the uh, and the frequency they uh, buy or, or play items with, and then you find uh, columns representing users that are similar to each other but not exactly similar, and you take these differences and recommend them to the other user being similar. So in this tiny uh, toy case, you might conclude that the top, the top green lines are similar and the bottom ones are not, so therefore we should recommend the third, third row to the user on the left and the fourth row to the user. Sorry, third to the one on the right and fourth to the one on the left. Now in reality, these uh, matrices can be fairly big. You might have lots of users and lots of items. In, in the Spotify case, we have 500 million or 50 million active users, a lot more uh, inactive users, and then there's about 20 million songs, so that's a fairly big matrix. So you can approximate this matrix with the uh, techniques I mentioned. If you take the original matrix and flip it around so that you have coordinates and values, then that's the same representation as the one on the left, assuming that it's long enough. And then you sort it by the values. And then you cut it off uh, using the top K or top K with uh, CMS that I mentioned earlier. Then you have an approximation of the, uh, of the similarity matrix, but with the noise, with the low frequency stuff shaved off that matrix. And you can use that approximation instead, which is, can be a lot smaller and still sufficiently accurate to do your, your recommendations algorithms. Is this comprehensible? Yeah, uh, the first flip is coordinates on the left. So zero, zero, that's this point, three. Zero, one, that's this five, zero, two, and so forth. So it's the same data, just flipped around. That's about it. Uh, if you, this sort of made you realize that you can do things that you thought you might not be able to do before, uh, these are some pointers to, uh, to others explaining similar things. Uh, Mickey Brown presentation was an insp inspiration for this one. And if you want to dig deeper in what you can do, uh, Ted Dunning has a real cool presentation on, on like anomaly detection with, uh, with uh, real time uh, with streaming uh, technology. Uh, if you want to learn about Storm, Ted Dangini has a good pre some good presentations on that as well. There are open source, uh, decent uh, quality open source implementations, Dreamlib in Java, Algebra from Twitter is in Scala, 
They have like the top K and the count min sketch and so forth. But it's not complicated. It's a few hundred lines of code. Uh, so it's, you might as well tweak it or whatever. Cool? We are looking for people. I'll just let that one stand. <laughs> OK, so you know what to do if you want to work in this field. I think uh, judging from the other talks, we didn't have too many questions. So I think we'll have questions in the coffee break. So we'll have some coffee. And hopefully your, um, I guess, creative uh, spirits will soar after that. Thank you, everybody. See you after the coffee break at around 3 o'clock. <laughs>